So last week, we are continuing our, service, our, our series in Beyond. We're talking about going over lines or breaking down walls and going beyond things. And last week, we specifically talked about going beyond. We, we were in the book of Matthew, Matthew 28, and we are in the Great Commission. And I, I posited that there are three main things that I see going on there, that we are supposed to go beyond our doubts and uncertainties. We're supposed to go beyond ourselves that is, we're supposed to modify, uh, multiply and that we are to be go, go beyond our borders. And so I'm going to unpack a few of those over the next uh, several weeks. And the first one I wanted to talk a little bit was about fear. And I saying going beyond fear. So just to think about fear, fear is a natural thing. It's a God-built-in uh, response that we have to things that are dangerous around us. It, it keeps us safe. It keeps us from harm. I mean, think of the example. If I, if I was walking along and I saw a rattlesnake, I wouldn't say, oh, let me pet the rattlesnake. I'm not sure you could pet a rattlesnake. But point is, is it's, it's, it, you would naturally, you hear that rattle, it's meant to pull you back. If you saw a car hurtling at you, you wouldn't say, I wonder if he's going to turn. You'd get out of the way. Fear has a natural response to, fear is a natural response we have, and that God has built that into us, and it, it gets the uh, adrenaline going. I remember one time I stood at, at, a, uh, um, at a building in Chicago, and, and it has glass out there, and you can put your head against the glass and stare down. I don't know if it was like 100, 100 floors or something. It's a long ways, and you had this feeling like you were just going to plummet to your death. And I'm not even one that's really afraid of heights, and I still had this moment of like, oh, my goodness. I'm going to die. But it gets the adrenaline going. Um, so the other thing I wanted to bring up is that the news, and, and whether it be newspapers or whatever it is, they keep us afraid. Have you ever noticed that? It's part of the job that they do. Now, I'm not trying to harsh on them so much of the, the point that they are reporting news, but the type of news and how they bring it across and all those sorts of things is meant to bring a response of fear or scare. Now, once in a while, they have something that's a great heartwarming story about, you know, a, a, I don't know, a, a water skiing squirrel or something like that. But the, most of the time, it's bad stuff. I actually, one, uh, at one point in my life, I remember specifically saying, no more. I'm not going to watch the local news. And I'm not saying if you watch the local news, you're a bad person. I'm not saying that. But just you need to be in, tuned into the fact that they're going to bring things across, whether it's a newspaper or whatever, that are going to scare you. They're going to bring things. Oh, bad news for this, bad news for that. Oh, my goodness, this is going to happen. Whether it be, you know, the stock market or, or threats of war or terror, or what's in our food or what's not in our food. How will we live without this? How will we be able to survive on this or retirement? What is the government doing? Did all these different things are meant to kind of bring a response out of us so that we'll tune in, so we'll spend the time listening to those. And that doesn't help our case. It makes us more afraid. So sometimes these are things we face, but oftentimes they're things that we really don't need to be concerned about all that much. And we're going to talk a little bit about fear and how to uh, address it, but before we go too far, let's pray. And Heavenly Father, I pray that as we go through and we understand fear, we'd understand it, what it is, what it should be, and what it can be from your point of view. Lord, as we talk through the, this time here, as we study your word, Lord, I pray that you would bless us in the reading of your word and that we would understand a little bit more of how we can address these things as God's people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In just a moment, I will give you an example. I wanted to hold off on that because I wanted to, to, to build up a little bit of, of an understanding of this before we go right into uh, the Scripture. But um, So this fear of danger, uh, one of the things I wanted to, to bring out is that fears are both uh, are a couple different things. We can be a, a, a fear of what is immediately dangerous to us, but there's a lot of different kinds of fear. There's, there's fears of failure. There's fears of the unknown, fears of rejection, fears of flying, stage fright, fear of reprisal, fear of death, fear of imperfection, fear of disappointment. And some people, these are much higher than they are in other people. Sometimes they don't make any sense at all. You know, one of the things that I, I wanted to give as an example is that sometimes people say, well, when somebody goes up and, and speaks in front of a lot of people, that, well, that's because they're not afraid of doing that sort of thing. But you will hear story after story after story of speakers or pastors or other people who get up front, and they get up front for different reasons. Now, some people get up there for ego reasons. I will tell you that I don't have a lot of ego built into this. I don't prefer, 
I've told this to people here. I don't prefer to do what I'm doing, but I do it because God has called me to do it. I'd much rather be over in the choir loft or doing something else and participating in worship in a different way. But this is what I feel God called me to do. And so because of that, I can get past any sort I fear I would of having in front of a a bunch of people. I've heard some people say, well, the way to, to be able to get over your fears, and they give some different things. They say, imagine everybody in their underwear or something like that. I've never found that helpful. It's a little disturbing, in fact. It's a little distracting, to say the least. So, but the point is, there's lots of different things that people say, and that, there are ways to address fears. Don't get me wrong. You can work with the counselor. You can do a lot of the things. My point is, is there's a different way of addressing fear from a biblical point of view. Um, so how do we get past our fears? Well, first thing, let's divide it into two types of fears. The first is what I'll call the rational and the irrational. Or the first is the rational, and the second is the irrational. And I'm not going to talk so much about irrational fears today. Uh, if you're afraid of spiders or small spaces or evil leprechauns or something like that, there are ways to address that, but that's not what we're going to talk about because that's not in our scripture today. I'm going to be talking more about rational fears, that there is indeed something to fear, that there are consequences, that there's a danger there. How do we overcome those fears? Well, let's take a look at the book of Acts, and let's, let's go through our scripture right now. Acts chapter 4, verses 13 through 20. Sorry, it's a little bit small there for you. Uh, Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man had been healed standing there with them, uh, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they've performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. That is the name of Jesus. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So they, they've gone and they've done this miraculous uh, sign, and all the, the Sanhedrin who are there, uh, the, the religious leaders are like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do with this? Because they're against them. But rather than see God's hand in it, rather than hear the name of Jesus and believe on Jesus, they're like, how do we deal with this? Well, and so they bring uh, Peter and John before them, and they try and handle it in kind of a, a, a man-oriented, you know, a, a humanity-oriented way. And they try and scare them. And they try and say, oh, there's going to be, you're going to be in trouble. I mean, there's, there's real possibilities there of, of what fears could be. But what is it that helps these disciples be so self-assured in the, in the face of, of possible, uh, you know, either ridicule or imprisonment, possibly death, all these different things that could be happening in front of these very powerful religious leaders. And yet, they don't seem to be afraid at all. Why is that? And I've heard different people talk about this passage, and I wanted to clarify something a little bit. One of the things is the word that it translates their courage is fine to translate it as courage. But I don't really like the word courage so much because courage in the verse 13 kind of carries this idea that they, they, they saw the courage of Peter and John, but it carries this aspect of bravery, such as like a heroic warrior that would rush onto the field or somebody who would rush into a burning house and, and save a, a, a child. And, and that kind of courage and that sort of, uh, of bravery is, is definitely laudable. But I don't think that's quite what's going on here. So the reason why I don't like it is because it, it has this sense that, that somehow they're facing their fears, which is a good thing. But I don't get the feeling here that Peter and John are sitting there saying, oh, we've got to muster up our courage and steer these religious authorities in face, stare them down. Instead, there seems to be some sort of other self-confidence some sort of boldness, and that's another way to translate that word. Instead of courage, you can translate it boldness. And there seems to be a holy boldness that is in them. So that's the word I'd like us to go with, boldness. Because bravery is, I think, much more of a, a, a facing something fearful because you really have no choice. They say, you know, I'm, you know little Johnny's going to get a shot in the, in the arm. So be brave. If he had his option right now, he wouldn't get a shot. 
Well, it needs to be brave because this is something that has to happen. It's being brave is, being, is, is facing something fearful because you have no choice and you do it anyway. And that's a good thing. But boldness is facing something that you fear because you choose something higher. I'll say that again. Boldness is facing something you fear because you choose something higher. In other words, they could have backed down. Couldn't they? No, they'll say we can't. But because of something they hold higher. But from a human point of view, they could back down. Well, boldness overcomes fear. Boldness, holy boldness, overcomes fear. Bravery and courage often rise out of the person. A person is said to have ba- bravery or to, to be courageous, but holy boldness is a decision, not a personality trait. I'll say that again. Holy boldness is, is, a, is a decision, not a personality trait so much. It's not something that we were born with so much, but something that we were born again into. It's not a personality trait, but a decision. So where does this boldness come from? I would say this boldness comes from a fear of God. It comes from another fear, but in a different sort of sense of the word fear, a fear of God. Psalm 111 verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Godly wisdom sees the reality of things from, a God, from God's perspective. So we don't need to be afraid of those things because we see things from a different perspective and we put things and we hold things at a higher regard that most people wouldn't. I give an illustration. I do have permission for my son to use this. But I I was telling him earlier, I was trying to use one of those opportunities to be able to kind of say, hey, that's a really good trait. Okay, he was praying in front of the school here. It's a new school for him and so forth. And he said, well, I'll pray. He's always been good about that. Uh, And so he said, I'll pray. And he he did a great job. And he was was commended for that. And I was telling him, I'm like, you don't realize what a gift that is to be able to go up in front of a bunch of people that you're still getting to know and so forth and, and pray. And the response was actually even better because he said, well, he says, Dad, I wasn't praying to them. I was praying to God. I thought, oh, man, that is even better of a gift to understand, to see things from God's perspective and to say, look, it's not about just saying, oh, imagine them in our underwear. It's, saying, it's about the fact that I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to God. And I think you see that same sort of thing in here. They're like, they're like hey, is it better for us to do what you say or to do what God says? You be the judges, which is their way of saying, duh. <laughs> It's obvious. You guys should be able to see that as well. You be the judges of that because you should be able to see it as well. So what do we do when we're afraid? Holy boldness overcomes fear. We have holy boldness in Christ's name, and that overcomes the fear. Boldness drives out human fear. Know that it doesn't really take it all together away, all together every time. But it just subjugates it to something larger. It puts it below a higher meaning. So back to Peter and John. They are faced with persecution, ridicule, the real possibility of imprisonment or even death, and yet they they say, as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Jesus' disciples, think about this. Jesus' disciples were all just a short while ago, huddled in a room, hiding from the authorities after Jesus was crucified, but before he appeared to them. But here, they don't only not hide, but they're exposed because they can't help but expose the truth of what they know and what they have seen. Peter, look at Peter. He's often described as kind of a a brash or bold person and unflinching in the moment. Yet, don't forget that he even denied Jesus three times for the fear of the crowd. But here, they're bold. As for us, we cannot help speak, but We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard because boldness drives out fear, which is right, they say, to listen to God or to listen to you. We choose God, for we fear God, not men. So what do we choose? What do we hear in this room? As as Christians, do we fear God or do we fear men? Do our fears control us or do we subjugate them to something higher? Well, fear can keep us safe. There's no denying that. But holy boldness walks past the line of safe and does the will of God. So picture for a moment a church that is unafraid of what the world thinks of them and is only concerned 
of what God thinks of them and spreading the gospel. A church made up of individual Christians, you and I, who cannot help but telling others the good news. We're unafraid of what they think of us. We can concentrate simply on loving them and helping them with the joy of the Lord in our hearts. Holy boldness is a decision, not a personality trait. So let's all agree now to choose to set aside our fears, to choose to be bold, to have a loving and holy boldness that allows us to press on through our fears, cross the lines that others would shy away from and and fall back from. Let's cross those lines and boldly tell the good news of Jesus Christ to a hurting world and what Christ means to us and what he could mean for them. Maybe that means sharing a coffee with someone. Maybe someone at work. Maybe somebody in a group that you don't even know if they know Christ. Maybe it's welcoming a new neighbor. Maybe offering to pray for somebody you've just met. You might be surprised at the results. Like the disciples did, let us live with a holy boldness that fears God, not men. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we could use this example from your word, that we could be bold for the gospel, that we could be bold for you, Lord, because the gospel is good news to a hurting world. Even though they say they don't want to hear it, at the right God-appointed time, they see their need. And Lord, I pray that we would not shy away from those lines, but we would boldly cross those lines, not in our own name, not because it's our own personality trait, not because it's comfortable, but because it's the right thing to do in your name. And it's in your name we pray all these things. Amen.